Take a walk inside a park, or jaunt a forgotten trail. Close your eyes and listen. Take a deep breath and exhale. For nature's call invites you. It's peaceful and serene. It heals the body deep within, naturally, not by artificial means. Aromatherapy business would all be obsolete. Your pharmaceutical agencies would drop significantly. Hospitals would concentrate on healing the terminally ill instead of fighting illnesses brought on by pollution's will. Saving the environment is bigger than you think. It not only affects society, it pulls health from the brink. The Brink by Sylvia Stoltz. Welcome everybody to the Pickle Podcast. I am your host, Pickles on Mail. Today's episode is going to be a little different from usual as my co-host is not here to join me this time. While we usually talk about a variety of topics, news, and hypotheticals, today will be a special episode focusing on one topic in particular, which is pollution. I know it's a bit out of left field, but look, it's a school project, but I also learned a lot of interesting info from the research, and I hope you can learn something from it too. It's also a format that we've been wanting to try out for a while now, and now we can finally put it to test. Firstly, there's a reason why pollution is an issue. While of course the environment is something we should care and nurture for, pollution also has a large effect on the mortality and health of us people. Let's take a look at the data and see for ourselves. The World Health Organization, or WHO, who you probably know by now, identified air pollution as the number one reason for environment-related deaths in the world. An estimated 4.2 million deaths per year were attributed to outdoor air pollution and 3.8 million deaths per year from indoor air pollution. Now just to clarify, usually it doesn't directly cause it, but rather accelerates death. Nonetheless, this is still a huge number. There's still more side effects to humans other than just death, things that could affect you and me. For example, a 2001 CDC report stated asthma attacks and hospital admissions for heart and lung illnesses increased during high pollution episodes. This is quite the issue, since the CDC report also states 14.5 million Americans currently have asthma, and it's also become the most common chronic illness among American children. A 2020 report from the University of California had also summarized some findings of the effects of air pollution on neurological development. It suggests that exposure to air pollution during pregnancy and childhood is linked with changes to brain structures and other more subtle outcomes like lower test scores and disorders like ADHD and ASD. The WHO also used data gathered from satellite-generated models and found 91% of the world's population lives in areas with excess PM2.5 levels. PM just means particulate matter, which are formed as a result of burning fuel and chemical reactions. With everything we just said considered, 91% of the human population is far too high of a number to be living in polluted air. So far, we've covered the issue on a pretty global scale, but where can we find this problem? Well, we can find it mainly in urban industrial areas over rural areas for a couple of reasons. Well, for one, they're typically crowded centers that attract many people. In fact, 55% of the world's population lives in urban areas today and is expected to increase to more than two-thirds by 2050. And since population tends to attract air pollution through the use of resources and vehicles, they tend to be the primary source of air pollution in any given area. And the second reason is because factories and other major polluters are typically located in cities, where production is demanded and the workforces are more abundant as a result of readily available labor. And those two reasons play into when and where it all started. The Industrial Revolution. While living things naturally pollute the environment, the rate of such pollution began to kick up during and after the Industrial Revolution. Industrialization is a process in history where nations economically developed, beginning in Britain. Basically, production and trading became ever so more important, and it's been crucial in the course of human history and creating high-income societies. While many good things came out of it, like lower mortality rates, higher living standards, advances in medical sciences and improved sanitation, during the industrial period and still today, there were some issues. Near the turn of the 19th century, free market capitalism began to take root in Britain 
that would result in economic growth and a rise in industries for profit making. While there were still jobs available at individuals' homes, which was called an outwork system, the main organization of work took place in a factory setting, called the factory system. So how did this all start with industrialization? Well, with the widespread use of factories for manufacturing, British and later country cities became a large source of coal burning. The coal industry of Britain was rapidly expanding during the 18th and 19th centuries, with increasing demands and falling prices on coal. And so with coal cheaper, this ultimately led to even more coal consumption nationwide, which started from 20 million tons in 1820 to 160 million tons in 1900, quite the jump. In fact, in Britain, there were 50 times the emissions of black smoke before the implementation of the Clean Air Acts that we have today. The frequent use of coal in coal-powered industries released sulfur and nitrogen compounds, which had not just an adverse effect on the environment and wildlife, but also human health. During the 1800s, higher coal intensity was associated with higher death rates from respiratory disease, mainly among the elderly and very young. And so air pollution deaths throughout the revolution rose, with death rates in London that claimed the lives of 25 out of 100,000 people in 1840, which increased to 300 out of 100,000 people by 1890, just half a century later. On top of that, just a 1% increase of coal intensity raised the death of infants by 1 in 100 births. Coal burning also led to repeated respiratory illnesses and even hindered the growth of children and caused shorter heights among adults, with men who grew up in the most polluted districts of Britain being almost an inch shorter than those who experienced cleaner air. So now, you might be asking, how is Europe doing today? Well first, there's London. This graph shows the degradation of air quality in London during the Industrial Revolution, which was measured in concentrations of suspended particulate matter. The air worsened with each decade after 1700 until it reached its peak. Then after its peak, it made drastic improvements and air pollution dropped significantly to modern day. This could be attributed to the Public Health Act of London in 1891, which had London businesses be punished with financial penalties if they produced excessive smoke and didn't adopt cleaner and more efficient energy practices. There was also a shift in the primary power source for households, from using coal to mainly gas during the 1800s to 1900s. The 2% of residents with gas cookers rose to 69% from 1892 to 1911. Because coal releases much more harmful pollutants into the air for humans and the environment than gas, the switch actually made our airs relatively safer. Now, on the other hand, the same graph shows Delhi's concentration of suspended particulate matter, which is in higher ranges than London is today. Well, let's step back from what's happening in Europe for a second and ask, what has the United States done to combat this? Well, let's take a look back in American history just before the beginning of the 19th century, where industrialization entered the states. Coal, like in Britain, was a staple for many industries' power source during the American Industrial Revolution. American enterprises started after their British forefathers, and factories began springing up along the east coast of the United States. Because of this new wave of technology, new industries were born as a result, which included the textile, cotton, and other manufacturing industries. Like in Pennsylvania, large furnaces and rolling mills appeared to replace blacksmiths. The spread of technology also reached the southern states, where the cotton and wool industries were born. In general, the spur in factories and corporations attracted rural populations to urban settings. And this is where air pollution had most drastically started to take off in America. And this is a continuing trend with nations undergoing industrialization. So, economies and populations continue to grow. Vehicles and new methods of transportation were introduced and caused the number of cars and trucks to increase dramatically in the United States. The increase in motor vehicles was mainly found in the cities, and soon enough it began to seriously affect public health and the environment as it polluted the air. Luckily, compared to vehicle models in 1970, we have much cleaner vehicle models, cars, SUVs, and pickup trucks today. In fact, they're roughly 99% cleaner than common pollutants like carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide than vehicles during 1970. 
buses and heavy-duty trucks have become cleaner by 99% as well. However, vehicles are not entirely safe. They not only emit large quantities of nitrogen oxide, but also large amounts of carbon monoxide and volatile organic compounds, both of which are contributing air pollutants. This is why worldwide, an issue of pollution persists in urban cities and industrialized zones where vehicle transportation is significantly more abundant. That being said, the United States Environmental Protection Agency was the most important force to recovering from air pollution, though we're still not perfect. Just one way they do this is by granting money to organizations so they may help them succeed in their environmental goals, as they award more than $4 billion in funding for grants to both small and large organizations or governments. In 1970, Earth Day was introduced as a movement promoting environmentally friendly activity, leading the way for many legislation to combat environmental degradation and air pollution. Out of the many legislation brought up, there was the Toxic Substances Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, and most notably, the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act was introduced in 1970, and over the following decades, it helped to drastically reduce the amount of air emissions we produce in the U.S. It went through several amending processes to strengthen the implementation of state plans, and the result paid off in dividends. Between 1990 and 2019, the combined emissions of the six common pollutants were reduced by 77%. Those include, bear with me here, nitrogen dioxide, which went down by 59%, sulfur dioxide by 90%, ozone 25%, particulate matter 43%, carbon monoxide 78%, and lead 85%. And even with these beneficial changes, the U.S. didn't need to suffer for it. The U.S. economy continued to grow, while population growth and energy use are still on the rise. So, I'll stop talking about the U.K. and the U.S., but you may be asking now, what about the rest of the world? Well, the thing is, the Asian and African continents haven't really been doing so well. This 2019 global map looks at the weighted population to annual PM2.5 concentrations. Continents like North America, parts of Europe, and Australia have relatively lower concentrations. On the other hand, we can see that the highest of the PM2.5 concentration is centered around Asian, Middle Eastern, and African regions. This map shows an interesting finding. Both the Western European regions and North American continent had first begun industrializing their economy, but in modern day, we see them as having the least concentrations of the air pollutants. Their Asian and African counterparts, however, were slower to adopt these practices, so presently we see them as being higher contributors of pollution. And so the mining, manufacturing, farming, and exporting industries of those regions are shown having polluting effects similar to the era of British industrialization. Now these graphs break down data from the World Health Organization on particulate matter and was the last updated in 2016. Globally, the top cities located in the Middle East, India, China, and parts of Africa are the leading polluters to this day, which is in large part due to the various sources of pollutants in those regions. Sources of pollutions include manufacturing, farming, vehicle usage, and more that are largely due to the wave of modern industrialization. In the US and Canada, we see cities primarily in the California, Indiana, and Pennsylvania state as contributing the most of America's air pollution. This 2010 map of the US metropolitan areas is labeled with various industries, color-coded by dots. If we match the two sources, the list of worst pollution American cities, and this map, there's actually an overlap. The state of California, Indiana, and Pennsylvania all have concentrations of urban industries, and cities belonging to these states all produce the highest amount of air pollutants in the US. While there are other factors that could contribute, such as population and farming, industrialization of the state was ultimately the root of these polluted cities. But do note the significant differences between the pollution of the states and the world's worst polluters in the Middle East. It's more than a tenfold difference, which is no small amount. In Europe without Turkey, also yes, there are two versions of the graph with and without Turkey, countries like Macedonia, Poland, and Bulgaria made it on the list of worst polluters in Europe. If we decide to include Turkey, they seem to take up a majority of the space on the list. 
So I guess we can see why they separated the two graphs from each other. Something we should note is that in these countries, Turkey, Macedonia, and Poland, are all further east in Europe compared to Western European countries, such as the UK. It just comes to show that this outward spread of industrialization from Western Europe is pretty consistent in the African, Eastern European, and Asian continents. Speaking of Asia, there is also a separate list of cities for the Asian continent, with cities in India and surrounding countries ranking to be the highest contributor to particulate matter in Asia. Delhi is the highest in this regard, followed by Dhaka in Bangladesh and Beijing in China. These points of data show the total amount of outdoor, also called ambient, air pollution deaths from 1990 to 2017. This plots countries for their total deaths attributed to air pollution, including India and China, just to name the big players. By the way, the dot at the very top of the list is China, along with the United States being sent next to Russia. On this chart, you ideally want to be above the line that goes through the middle, since that would mean a country's deaths have diminished from 1990 to 2017. Though, do keep in mind, these numbers aren't exactly indicative of how much air pollution a nation puts into the air. For instance, China and India do have very large populations, and thus more deaths are to be expected. Same goes with countries like Japan, the US, the UK, Germany, and more. That's also why island countries in North America are plotted lower on the graph, yet they sit below the line going through the middle, which would indicate there was an increase in deaths relating to air pollution over the decades in those regions. Unfortunately, the numbers of deaths are only increasing in parts of the world. For example, in 2015, China and India combined accounted for 2.2 million deaths from PM2.5 pollution, which is a 30% increase from 1990. But these high numbers don't just appear simply as a result of growing populations, but also the output of pollutants these countries release into the air. Let's dig further into the issue in China on air pollution. According to a 2002 paper on China, China is growing economically with an annual increase in GDP of 8 to 9% from 1978 to 1999 as a result of industrialization of the modern era. This outsourcing of manufacturing is not necessarily ideal, however, as air pollution is a persisting problem in China, as we saw earlier that listed China's industrial cities among Asia's worst polluters. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, coal supplied more than half of China's total energy consumption in 2019. And the harmful pollutants produced by coal are credited for being a major source of air pollution. This is a problem since China's urban cities have been relying on these sources of energy for a means of production, and it's put a burden on the health of the citizens, workers, and the environment. The report further states that China's oil consumption growth made up two-thirds of the global oil consumption in 2019, though the growth of oil demand has slowed as the country seeks alternative fuels for energy. To monitor and regulate the output of pollutants, China has also put up air pollution monitoring systems since the mid-1970s, which includes China's biggest cities like Beijing, Shenyang, Shanghai, and others. In addition, the Chinese government has also begun research on the urban air pollutants, environment planning, and developing technologies with the help of the United Nations Development Program, the EPA, and other world organizations. So action on the issue of air pollution is being made, though more rigorous implementation and real consequences are going to be needed for these urban centers to have healthier airs. This doesn't just pertain to them though. A news release from the University of California showed that China's air pollution has actually affected the US despite the vast Pacific Ocean between them. According to the news release, global westerly winds have carried the emissions from Chinese manufacturing factories to Los Angeles on the west coast of the United States, causing it to experience an extra day of smog every year that exceeds federal ozone limits. Exporting factories were still the biggest sources of pollutants out of the 42 sectors of China's exporting industries. The black carbon produced from these processes aren't warmly welcomed either. Black carbon itself is linked to asthma, like we said before, cancer, emphysema, and heart and lung disease. And an extra day in black carbon infested airs could have many hospitalized. This just serves as a constant reminder, even if the Asian continent may seem like a world's distance away, what we put into the air does have consequences, and that people are the ones who have to pay for it.
Before we mentioned Africa, and there's a reason why, air pollution has topped the charts as being the leading cause of premature deaths of Africa in 2013, rivaling other factors like unsafe water, unsafe sanitation, and childhood malnutrition. Furthermore, a report from the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, or UNICEF because that's a mouthful, states only 7 of Africa's 54 countries have real-time air pollution monitors, and only 6% of African children live within 50 kilometers of an air quality monitoring station. In comparison, that number is 72% in Europe and North America. And if you don't feel like doing the math right now, that's a 66% difference between African children and European and North American children. It's no wonder that air pollution has prematurely claimed the lives of so many in Africa and elsewhere around the world. The author of this article also suggests that due to lack of reporting in Africa, the true numbers and the issue of air pollution could very much be larger than it seems. Quite a scary but realistic prospect. This is made even more unsettling as the same UNICEF report states deaths from outdoor pollution in Africa grew by 60% between 1990 and 2017. Simply all these factors contribute to not just Africa's but the world's issue of air pollution. We also can't ignore the problem in the Indian subcontinent, as many polluted cities are ranking high on the air quality index, or AQI. For instance, the industrial district Ghaziabad was given the grade of hazardous level on the AQI index, touching the number 435 in November 2020. For background information, the AQI index is the EPA's index for reporting air quality and grades on a scale ranging from 0 to 500, 0 being the best and 500 being the worst. Other polluted cities in India include Agra, which was graded 428 on the AQI index, Noida, which was graded 427, Bulan Shahar, 420, and Kampur, 415. Furthermore, the Central Pollution Control Board, or CPCB, warns that an AQI above 400 affects healthy people and severely impacts those with pre-existing diseases like asthma. These cities easily surpass the hazardous level and are above 400 on the AQI index, and extreme levels can be traced back to the pollution emitted from vehicles, industrial factories, thermal power plants, waste burning, and construction dust. This issue isn't necessarily new, but rather a continuation of bad policy decisions and negligence. The problem has been here since the 1980s as strong legislation on pollution control were introduced, yet pollution continued to occur. In 1998, the government launched the National Air Quality Monitoring Program that put up monitoring stations across the country to assess air pollution. The Air Quality Standards Act also sought to improve the air quality as it provided a standard for the nation's air quality. However, even with these actions and many more, the sources of air pollution are still growing from 4.24 million in 2004 to 10.8 million in 2018. During that period, Delhi faced one of its worst smog episodes in October of 2016, where PM 2.5 levels were above 12.5 times above the limit, causing smog to engulf the streets of Delhi. In fact, the air quality had gotten so bad in New Delhi during the episode that the high pollution levels forced schools to close for several days, which restricted many Indian children's access to education. In response to the smog episode, the Delhi government took steps to lessen the increase in vehicles, hoping to reduce emissions from that source of pollutants. Though its implementation did not achieve its fullest effects, nor did it create a long-term impact. And while India has been imposing tough emission standards for their power plants, the state utilities that own much of India's coal power plants still do not comply. Despite all these actions by concerned people and organizations, ultimately, it did little to curb the upward trajectory of air pollution across India. Their urban locations are especially affected due to the cramped environment and greater possibilities to be exposed and harmed by the pollutants in the air. So far, we've seen the effects of pollution today, but let's quickly rewind to the night of December 2nd, 1984. That December night in Bhopal, India, chemical methyl isoconate, a chemical used for pesticide, 
spilt out from Union Carbide India's pesticide factory. The 30 tons of methyl isoconate gas killed more than 15,000 people and affected over 600,000 workers. The effects didn't just stop there. The infant mortality rate rose up to 200%, and stillbirth rates shot up to 300%. Trees in the nearby area became barren, and bloated animal carcasses had to be dealt with. The city felt its effects too, as people ran across streets vomiting and dying while cremation grounds reached their maximum capacity. This was India's first industrial disaster, and known as possibly the world's worst industrial disaster as well. It's quite an extreme case, but it's a notable one to say the least. Throughout this episode, we've been pretty doom and gloom, and we've recognized this as a problem. Now the question is, what can we do about it? While it's tricky to change policy of an entire nation single-handedly, we can still combat the issue as individuals. For starters, enjoy riding a bike instead of driving for your commutes, whether it's for school, work, or just leisurely activities. And on that note, you can ride public transportation, or at least once the pandemic passes over. If you do drive a car though, consider keeping it well maintained. You can do so by getting regular tune-ups, checking it has proper tire pressure, etc. And while you're stuck at home, you may as well conserve electricity and energy by using natural lighting to light your indoor spaces instead. You can also use electrical or manual alternatives to gas-powered appliances like tools and lawnmowers. Do you enjoy grilling? Well, you can still do so with propane gas or electric grills instead of charcoal grills. Try to also reduce the amount of perfume and or deodorant you use, despite how shocking it may sound. The volatile organic compounds that are emitted from these scented goods can have both short and long-term adverse effects to your health. Research has also found that 40% of chemicals from consumer products end up in the air, which could then end up in the atmosphere for small particle formations to occur. This doesn't just go for perfume and deodorant though. Organic chemicals are widely used in household products like paints, varnishes, cleaning products, and cosmetic items. And finally, to protect yourself from pollution, drink some green tea. The catch-in content from green tea actually fights the harmful effects of air pollution in your body. Catch-in is an antioxidant, and it can be used to fight against the damage that oxidation from air pollution causes. Drinking tea will not just make your body healthier, but can help protect you against the harm that air pollution does to your lungs. But now, we should have covered a good amount on the history, examples, and things you can do to combat pollution. Hopefully you learned a thing or two and can use that information to not only stay informed, but also change a habit and create a new one that will improve your life and the people around you. Thanks for listening, everybody, and stay tuned for another episode on the Pickle Podcast. Peace.